The Jeep Wrangler is an icon that has managed to remain loyal to its roots while adapting to the changing spirit of the times. If you think that it's strictly for Californian rock hoppers and D-list boy band members, think again. This latest JL series model is the most credible Wrangler yet, justifying what Jeep sees as its position as the only true off-road company in the market. The Jeep Wrangler is one of the most iconic, serious SUVs on the planet and has never been a car to shy away from even the toughest SUV conditions. Like those, this JL series model was launched into at the end of 2018. By then, the European market had decided what a fashionable SUV should be like and it wasn't anything remotely resembling this. But the Wrangler's always gone its own way and for the few who want something more authentic, its appeal remains very much unique. A bit of history first. Shortly after the surface of the Earth cooled, vertebrates appeared, developed into dinosaurs and then died for reasons still not fully understood. Shortly thereafter, the original version of this model was first built, or perhaps it just seems like that. Actually, it was in 1938 when the US government's brief for a light reconnaissance vehicle resulted in the development of the Willys Jeep and the subsequent production of 368,000 of them for use during World War II. General George C. Marshall described it as America's greatest contribution to modern warfare. As most now know, the spiritual successor to the Willys Jeep is today's Jeep Wrangler. Much separates the two designs, of course. What's ideal for a theatre of war doesn't necessarily work for a family trip to the cinema. And over the years remaining in the 20th century, through CJ, YJ and TJ Wrangler models, as different company owners came and went, Jeep designers struggled with the need to develop this icon without losing its distinct appeal. Their biggest challenge came with this car's JK series predecessor, launched in 2007, which justified its existence in the modern SUV market with two Wrangler firsts, four doors and diesel power. But that JK series model still didn't really reach out beyond this car's hardcore base of enthusiasts. This, its successor, needed to continue to please these people, as it does, with better off-road angles, more ground clearance and a tighter turning circle. But at the same time, today's Wrangler needed to offer slightly wider appeal. For that, brand owners Fiat Chrysler knew that a completely fresh generation of powertrains would be required. And areas like ride quality, refinement and day-to-day -day usability would need to be completely re-evaluated, as they have been with this JL series car. It's a Wrangler, but perhaps not quite as you know it. Let's take a closer look. Previous Wranglers never had to be very good on road, as long as they didn't shake your fillings out on the way to your surf shack, all would be forgiven once you set a tyre on the rough stuff. But Marlboro men are in short supply these days. And to keep this car in customers, Jeep had to appeal beyond those who might use their cars as weekend mountain playthings. Without diluting what makes a Wrangler a Wrangler. No small task. Come to this car with no previous experience of this model and you might wonder whether the brand has achieved its lofty objectives here particularly if your variant of choice happens to be the top Rubicon version we're trying here. It gets knobbly, all-terrain BF Goodrich tyres that rumble over the tarmac with all the subtlety of a military convoy, and extra heavy-duty all-wheel drive mechanicals that further embellish the already prodigious 2.1-tonne curb weight. Forget SUVs, the back-to-basics experience here is really more akin to what you'd get in a utilitarian pickup, which could be fun with the roof open on a rural trail on a sunny day, but might just be annoying on a dark February morning on the school run. Of course, if you had had experience of former Wrangler models, your perspective would be very different, particularly if you've chosen one of the more accessible Sahara or Overland variants that get road-ready tyres and a more tarmac-orientated command track four-wheel drive system. 
Thanks to this fourth generation JL series model's five link suspension, potholes no longer feel like craters and the revised steering at least now seems at least to some extent inclined to take your commands into account rather than completely ignoring them for the first half turn of lock. The main changes though with this Mark IV design have taken place beneath the bonnet. It took half a century for the Wrangler to adapt to diesel power, but now large sections of the SUV market no longer want it. So Jeep owners fear Chrysler had to develop a credible petrol alternative. Hence the introduction of the two litre GME turbo unit we're trying here. It doesn't of course have the sheer grunt of the cutsy 3.6 litre petrol V6 that Jeep now only offers on this car in its US, African and Middle Eastern markets. But there's a useful 400 newton metres of torque that flows nicely through the leisurely perambulations of the new 8-speed ZF Auto gearbox that all modern Wranglers must now use. This isn't a car that takes kindly to being driven quickly, but if you were ever to, this four-cylinder engine's 272 brake horses shift it along almost alarmingly quickly. The rest to 62 mile an hour sprint dispatched in just 7.6 seconds, though the barn door aerodynamics restricts top speed to 99 miles an hour. Having been offered diesel power for the first time in the previous JK series model, a sizeable proportion of European Wrangler buyers will still require it, hence the provision of Fiat Chrysler's latest 2.2 litre Multijet 2 unit to replace the grumbly old 2.8 litre four-cylinder power plant fitted before. Despite the smaller size of this engine, power and torque have both increased over what was previously available to 200 horsepower and 450 newton metres respectively which means in a diesel variant that 62 miles an hour takes 10.3 seconds from rest before once more the Wrangler runs out of puff just sort of a three-figure maximum. Whatever your preference on engine, there's a two and a half ton braked towing capacity, at least for this four-door body style anyway. The alternative classic two-door version can tug along just one and a half tons. None of which is especially relevant to what this car has been primarily designed to do. Namely, drive to places you'd think twice about walking to without a backpack full of mountain climbing equipment. If the designers had democratised this JL series model to the point where it was no longer capable of such extreme feats, the whole point of Wrangler motoring would have been lost. So enthusiasts have been reassured that all versions of this fourth generation design continue to merit what the brand calls trail rated status. In fact, they've improved on it with better off-road angles, a tighter 10.4 meter turning circle and more ground clearance, so greater wading capacity. As with all proper off-roaders, there's a two-speed transfer case offering a series of dedicated 4x4 driving settings, proper mechanical ones, rather than the mere traction system software tweaks that masquerade as off-road modes in most modern SUVs. It's appropriate, then, that you access them not through buttons, but the old-fashioned way with a second gear lever that requires a very firm tug. This setup's first option lies in allowing you to shift from the default 2H rear-driven setting to 4H auto, which can now be done at speeds of up to 47 miles an hour and which gives you on-demand high-range four-wheel drive. For slightly boggier terrain, you can also shift the transfer case lever a notch to the right to access 4H part-time, which splits drive equally between front and rear axles. For more serious terrain, your final option is 4 low, which designates four-wheel drive low range, at which point in a Sahara or Overland variant, equipped with the command track four-wheel drive system, a 2.72 to 1 crawl ratio will be engaged. If you'll be using the extreme capability that last option delivers with even a passing level of frequency, then you won't be in one of those lesser Wrangler variants. Instead, you'll be amongst those who've gone straight for the most focused, the most serious Rubicon derivative that we're trying here, as well as the Narlia BF Goodrich 32-inch tyres we mentioned earlier. It gets Jeep's heavy-duty RockTrack four-wheel drive system, which uses a tougher low-range crawler ratio rated at 77.2 to 1 on this petrol version. Plus, you can press a dashboard button to detach this Wrangler's sway bars, we call them 
anti-roll bars this side of the pond, which allow more suspension travel. And if you're really stuck, you can individually lock this Rubicon model's heavy-duty Dana front and rear axles using the brand's True Lock electric front and rear axle lockers. A simpler anti-spin differential that works automatically and only on the rear axle is optional on Sahara and Overland models. You'd imagine that all this would deliver a virtually unrivaled set of off-road stats, and you'd be right. Helped by 252mm of ground clearance, this four-door Rubicon model offers an approach angle of 36 degrees, a departure angle of 31.4 degrees, and a breakover angle of up to 20.8 degrees, with all three figures fractionally improved upon by the two-door body style. You oversee all this from a superbly commanding driving position and you can monitor it all in real time via a series of selectable off-road pages on the centre dash Uconnect screen that deliver drivetrain data, a range of accessory gauges and virtual dials that show your Jeep's state of pitch and roll. Put all this to the test and you'll be glad of the four skid plates and on this Rubicon the heavy gauge tubular steel rock rails that protect the underside of this Jeep from rock and root damage. Plus, at up to five miles an hour, both body shapes can wade through up to 760 millimetres of water, or more if you were to fit the optional engine snorkel. So how does all this feel out in the wilds? Pretty darn impressive is the answer. Showing up to a green laning meet in a Wrangler is much like pitching up to a track day in a Porsche 911 GT3. You get instant respect and on the move a feeling that the car beneath you is capable of far more than you'll ever need it to deliver. And once you've had this experience, then venture back out onto the tarmac, you'll view this Jeep in a whole different light where before you might have been grumbling about the wind noise, the susceptibility to crosswinds, the vibrations you get through the controls, or the ocean liner line levels of steering response, exposure to this Wrangler's real talents leaves you far more disposed to tolerate its idiosyncrasies, maybe even to find them charming rather than irritating. And in terms of wind noise and crosswinds, why not go the whole hog and invite it all in? by getting out your socket set and taking Jeep up on its invitation to remove the doors, take off the roof panels and flatten the windscreen. In that form, there really would be nothing like the Wrangler experience. And maybe there isn't even with all the bodywork intact. In an age where most Jeep models merely trade on this brand's legendary heritage, this one lives it out, delivers it in road-ready form and writes a further chapter in the story. It reminds you of what an SUV once was and still can be. And it's one of a kind. The Wrangler format is iconic. A simple boxy body dropped onto an old style ladder frame chassis with a folding screen, detachable doors and a removable roof. You don't mess with that. Or with the familiar frontage, which offers up the usual circular headlights and familiar seven-slot grille. Elsewhere around the car, all the usual Wrangler hallmarks are present and correct. The separate bumpers, the outboard spare wheel and extended wheel arches flared at angles similar to those of the original Willys Jeep. Look more closely though and you'll find that much has changed as the designers have sought to subtly evolve the look for this fourth generation JL series model. That front grille, for instance, now has a canted upper section and its outer slats intersect with headlights that now feature full LED beams from Magneti Morelli. Even this vertical windscreen is different. It's now not quite so vertical and features a new four bolt design at the top of the frame that allows it to fold down far more easily. Though you've still got to get your socket set out to do it. That feature, by the way, was built into original Willys Jeeps to make them stackable for easy wartime shipping. The military style bonnet that also reminds you of that era features twin vents and chunky exposed catches. Daytime running lights now sit on the front of the trapezoidal wheel flares. And as before, fog lights are embedded deep into each corner of the chunky bumper. 
The profile perspective is much as it was with the previous JK series model, which was the Wrangler generation that introduced this lengthier wheelbase four-door body style. It's 550 millimetres longer than the continuing two-door variant, but that still leaves this car nearly 100 millimetres shorter than a comparably priced large SUV like Land Rover's Discovery. You're paying here for style and capability, not sheer size. As at the front, there are detailed changes if you care to look for them. Jeep has, for instance, slightly lowered the belt line so that the windows can be a fraction bigger for better visibility on extreme trails. And these huge black flared arches embellished at the front with pretend vents house 17-inch polished alloy wheels clad with 32-inch BF Goodrich mud terrain tyres on this Rubicon model. You'd get 18-inch rims and more road-orientated rubber if you were to opt for either Sahara or Overland trim. Traditional touches include exposed bolts and even an old-style coat hanger-style retracting aerial. Earlier, we mentioned the removable doors, now with corner shaping slightly altered so that they're less likely to be crashed into obstacles when being opened on sharp slopes. Detaching them is apparently a little easier this time round because they're now fashioned from lightweight, high-strength aluminium. You'll still need a spanner set for the job, though. Uh, Jeep has helpfully stamped the Torx bit tool size you'll need for the job on each of the prominent hinges. Let's move to the rear. Now, if you know your Wranglers, then the most obvious change will be these more stylized tail lamps, plus perhaps the installation of corner reflectors into this smarter bumper. More important, though, is the designer's decision to lower this spare wheel by 300 millimeters to improve visibility for both driver and passengers. As for the stuff you can't see, well, you won't be surprised to hear that serious structural strength means serious weight. Think 2.1 tonnes at the curb. OK, time to take a seat inside. Now, the aperture, unapologetically decorated with exposed rivet points, isn't especially wide. And getting in requires a big step up and a bit of a stretch over the obstructive sill. But it's worth it once you're in and seated commandingly in front of the gigantic three-spoke leather-stitched wheel. No, it's not super high quality in here, but at least you no longer feel you're piloting something that would pass muster as an exhibit in the Imperial War Museum. There's everything you need and nothing you don't with loads of wipe clean surfaces that encourage you to use the car in the way it was intended, rather than making you feel worried every time you get in with muddy boots. It's really all rather refreshing compared to the SUV norm. You're faced with a dashboard structure as bluff as the north face of the Eiger, but it's much more appealing than the boring plasticky layout that characterised the interior of the previous JK series model. The coloured fascia frontage, offered in grey, red or silver, aims to reference the metal panelled dashboards used in much earlier Wranglers, and the previous tightly sectioned centre stack has given way to a more open layout, though one absolutely festooned with knobs and buttons. We should talk about the open air aspect. All Wranglers come as standard with a three-piece modular hardtop. Jeep calls it a freedom top. That sort of thing was also fitted to the previous generation model, but the panels were so heavy and fiddly to remove that most owners hardly ever bothered to open them up. That'll change this time round because the ones at the front are much lighter and much easier to detach. You just unclip all these little catches and lift out these two front sections. They store away in tailored bags in the boot. Now, because the rear view mirror's connected to this header bar, its positioning isn't affected. The rear part of the roof, all the way back to the tailgate, can also be removed in a single hit. But unfortunately, that's a far more difficult process, requiring the removal of bolts on the lower edge of the window line on either side of the cargo area. But once you've done that, You'd need two people to lift the panel work off, and then, of course, you'd need to find somewhere to put the thing. In short, if all you're ever likely to do is want sunroof-style open-air access at the front, the Freedom Top arrangement will be fine. But if you really want to regularly be able to experience the full Willys Jeep-style open-air Wrangler feeling, then you're probably going to want to consider paying extra for one of the alternative roof packages the brand is offering this time round that replace the detachable panels with various forms of fabric hood. 
on the two-door variant. This takes the form of a manually operable premium soft top covering the whole of the roof and available with either clear or tinted windows. On this four-door version, you can have what the company calls a black Sunrider soft top that slots in behind the two removable Freedom Top panels. These are available either in black or body colour. The Sunrider hood folds back manually like the roof on a Mazda MX-5, or even better, you can have it specified in sky, one-touch power top form with electrical operation. With the roof fully down, the doors removed and the windscreen folded, the Wrangler driving experience really is like nothing else. As we were suggesting earlier, the cabin design's like nothing else either. In a Wrangler, you've always known exactly what you were sitting in. In a Wrangler that's twice as expensive as its predecessor, though, something more than quirkiness is required to steal stairs in the showroom. And with this fourth generation model, Jeep's obviously been very conscious of the importance of providing it. The need to retain the possibility for active owners to be able to hose out the cabin prevented the fixtures and fittings from being overly luxurious, but there are still plenty of premium touches like the leather-stitched upper dash trimming, the ambient LED interior lighting, the rubber overmoldings across many of the touch points, and the platinum chromed bezels for the four central vents. Plus, there are soft-touch vinyl-wrapped door panels with proper armrests and full leather upholstery for the Overland and Rubicon models, as well as heat for the steering wheel and for seats that feature standard lumbar support. It's all slightly undermined, though, by the polystyrene-type finish that decorates the inside of the roof panels. An optional hardtop headliner smartens this up a bit. Touchscreen infotainment has also made it to Wrangler motoring, specifically this 8.4-inch Uconnect center dash monitor, another interior feature developed with a nod to extreme SUV motoring. A series of off-road pages deliver drivetrain data, a range of accessory gauges and virtual dials that show your Jeep's state of pitch and roll. That's in addition, of course, to the usual vehicle information, audio and navigational readouts. Plus, there's Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring too. For best use of this infotainment setup, you'll want to download the compatible Uconnect Live app onto your smartphone that'll allow you to customise your onboard entertainment, accessing internet radio, online music and social media. The screen setup lacks physical shortcut buttons, but is admirably clear and intuitive to use, with voice activation and control systems that are easy to figure out, so you won't have to be delving into the manual every time you want to Bluetooth pair your phone or try to find a point of interest on the sat-nav. There's voice control, pinch and swipe functionality for the colour screen, and a text-to-talk feature if you need it. Anything the central monitor can't tell you, and much that it can, is covered off by the 7-inch TFT colour screen that now sits between the instrument cluster's two conventional dials. Using integrated buttons on the steering wheel, you can use this display to deliver a digital speedo, vehicle info, a virtual drivetrain diagram, a fuel economy meter, trip computer readings and audio settings. Of course, not all the changes are welcome. The new push-button starter, for instance, is somewhat obscured and you often find yourself mistakenly pushing the more accessible circular audio button that lies nearby. And these netted storage pockets added onto the bottom of the doors are almost useless. Plus, in a right-hand drive model like this, you have to awkwardly reach right across the cup holders to get to the handbrake. And you get a pedal box that lacks a left foot rest and may feel rather tight for folk with larger feet thanks to an intruding centre console. But all the retro stuff helps. Things like the Willys Jeep silhouette on the auto gear knob and the exposed bolts around the dash, as does that great view out. Well, it's a great view out of the front anyway, thanks to the seat positioning and the narrow A-pillars. Your view rearward isn't so great, but Jeep provides rear sensors and a rear view camera to compensate. Practical touches include a narrow, deep, lockable glove box with a chunky grab handle just above and a spacious, illuminated storage area between the seats with a lift-up top tray and a USB port. There are more USB ports and an aux-in point lower down the centre stack. Plus, the twin cup holders we mentioned earlier are lit at night. You get this small, narrow compartment on the top of the dash and vanity mirrors are fitted in the sun visors. 
Let's take a seat in the rear. Now this four door model's extra half meter of length might make possible a properly sized rear seat, but it doesn't deliver doors that open with a very wide aperture. And once you're inside, it's not hugely comfortable either, though it's obviously a huge improvement on the cramped conditions you'd get in the alternative two-door model. We thought legroom might be an issue here, but actually we think you get more complaints about the rather upright backrests for occupants on a longer trip. Predictably, there isn't really room for three adults back here, but this low centre transmission tunnel means that three children would fit OK. Those kids will be pleased to find twin USB ports and reading lights built into the exposed body structure that also rather neatly house these speakers for the Alpine audio system. There are netted storage pockets in the seat backs. So we're not quite sure what you're supposed to store in these curious ribbed panels just above. In addition, there are chunky grab handles and cubbies built into the door pulls. Plus, you get a fold down center armrest with twin cup holders. As for storage, well, the netted door pockets might be useful for slim items, but these shallow compartments on top of the transmission tunnel are almost useless, as is the narrow storage area that lies above. Still, if your driver has removed the doors and you're travelling al fresco open to the elements, you won't care about any of that. Travelling in the back on an SUV isn't usually an experience to be in any way savoured, but in a Wrangler, it can be. Let's finish with a look at the boot. Now, if you're wondering why Jeep's two-door and four-door Wrangler model badging doesn't include reference to a tailgate, it's pretty obvious once you get here because there isn't one. Just these pull-out lower and upper panels accessed by a chunky vertically set handle, which have the annoyance of being side opening. To be fair, that kind of arrangement doesn't seem to bother Toyota Land Cruiser customers very much, but because the setup's split here, it's slightly more awkward. You have to keep remembering, for instance, that you can't close the upper glass part while the lower section's in place. Once everything's opened up, there's a 533-litre boot, which ought to be bigger, but can't be because it's compromised by the tubular structural beams and the sighting of this huge audio speaker on the right-hand side here. Six tie-down points are provided, and there's a useful extra stowage beneath the boot floor, plus a 12-volt point on the left-hand side. An optional tailgate table can fold out of the lower part of the rear door. And here's a nice touch. In this little panel in the loading sill, you'll find little bespoke holes to store all the bolts you'd otherwise have rolling about all over the place after removal of the windscreen and the doors. There's no ski hatch or 40-20-40 rear seat split for longer items. So if you need more room, you'll need to push forward the 60-40 split rear seats. That frees up 1,044 litres of space. Surf shack dwellers will be disappointed to find that there's no option for a fold flat front passenger seat, which would be particularly useful on the two-door model. For the record, this variant offers a 197 litre boot, smaller than that of a VW Up city car, extendable to 587 litres if you drop the rear bench. This JL series Wrangler is more than twice as expensive as the previous JK series model we tested back in 2007, which may put it out of the reach of some parts of this model's traditional market of hardcore enthusiasts. Hence the need to widen the brief this time round to include fashionistas as well as adventurers. Those are, after all, the people most likely to afford a top variant like the one we have here, costing nearly £50,000. Let's get specific. There are, as before, two basic types of Wrangler, the classic two-door version, or for £2,000 more, the four-door variant tested here, which is the one most buyers will choose. Prices actually start from around £45,000, which seems a lot when you consider that the starting sticker price of a Wrangler in the US is the equivalent of around £20,000. But to be fair, that's for a base spec sport variant, a trim level that isn't offered here. For our market, the spec options start with Sahara trim, but most buyers will want to find £2,000 more to get either an Overland model or buy into the most serious Rubicon spec we're trying here. 
Under the bonnet, customers are offered a choice of a couple of identically priced engine options, both of which must be mated to eight-speed automatic transmission. Choose either a 2.2-litre Multijet 2 diesel with 200 horsepower, or, as in this case, a 2-litre GME petrol turbo unit with 272 horsepower. Sadly, Europe isn't being offered the gutsy 3.6-litre Pentastar petrol V6 that's available on this car in African and Middle Eastern markets. As for spec levels, well, you'd probably choose either Sahara or Overland trim if you were planning to do a fair amount of tarmac work with your Wrangler. Both these variants are properly trail rated in Jeep terminology with a proper two-speed transfer case that gives a lower range crawler gear. But they're fitted with more road orientated tyres and use the brand's slightly less extreme command track four-wheel drive setup. For true Wrangler aficionados, though, only this ultimate Rubicon variant will do. It gets the more serious RockTrack four-wheel drive system, which uses a tougher low-range gear ratio, heavy-duty front and rear axles, and true lock electric front and rear axle lockers to tackle really extreme off-road trails. Also helping a Wrangler Rubicon in dealing with this type of terrain are the 32-inch BF Goodrich mud terrain tyres and an electronic front sway bar disconnect system to provide additional wheel travel when conditions call for it. Enough with the range structure, where does this Wrangler sit in today's very different SUV market? Well, if you're asking us about competitors, there are none, or perhaps there are any number. It all depends on how you view things. This Jeep's newly exalted asking price theoretically pitches it against cars like a base four-cylinder petrol or diesel Land Rover Discovery, which would cost almost exactly the same, seat up to seven, and which would be a far easier thing to live with. But that Sullyhole model couldn't get close to matching a Wrangler in the rough, nor does it have this Jeep's extreme Explorer image. Not much else does. The Land Rover Defender is a much closer match. The new generation version hasn't been released at the time of this test in spring 2019, though had been much widely previewed. But that car's appeal is a very individual one. If you like it, you won't want this Wrangler and vice versa. And otherwise, well, we could talk all day about fashionable large and mid-sized SUVs priced in the 45 to 55,000 pound bracket, but none of them will please you if you really appreciate what this Jeep has to offer. A mid-spec Toyota Land Cruiser probably gets closest, but that comes only in diesel form with a significantly less powerful engine and can't be had in high-spec short wheelbase form. Other than that, a high-spec pickup, say a Mercedes X-Class, probably gets nearest to what this Wrangler has to offer. But that then takes you into the LCV market. And in any case, Jeep now has its own entrant in that segment, the Gladiator. So, if you want a pickup, the American brand thinks you'd be more likely to choose one of those. Overall, it's difficult to escape the conclusion that there's nothing quite like a Wrangler. It offers the kind of SUV recipe that if you were buying in the 15 to 20,000 pound bracket would see you choose a Suzuki Jimny. And if you were spending 95 to 100,000 pounds would see you buying a Mercedes G-Class. Or if you were in America, something like a Hummer. This Jeep, like those cars, simply laughs at its hopelessly compromised mainstream SUV competitors and leaves them for dead when the road, the trail or the track turns gnarly. On top of that, try finding another capable SUV that comes with a detachable roof. Enough with the comparisons. Let's say you've decided on a Wrangler. Can Jeep justify those premium asking prices with premium levels of equipment? Well, let's see. We've just referenced the fact that all Wranglers get the potential for open-air motoring, given the standard fitment of what Jeep calls a Freedom Top, a three-piece modular hardtop with two lift-off front sections and a rear part you can remove with a socket set. Plus, as ever with a Wrangler, if you're handy with a spanner, you can take off the doors for a really uninhibited feel and even fold forward the windscreen to give you more fresh air in the face or maybe just a clearer view of the trail ahead. Now, what other modern production car offers either of those things? There isn't one. On to specific trim-related spec features, starting with the base Sahara spec models. 
These come with 18-inch polished wheels with grey spokes, full LED headlamps and the rear parking sensors and rear view camera you'll need given the restricted rearward visibility. There's also keyless entry, tubular side steps and a body coloured freedom top, a three-piece modular hard top. Other exterior features include deep tint sunscreen glass, a vinyl spare wheel cover, auto headlights with headlamp levelling, power heated mirrors, front fog lamps and a premium security alarm. Inside, a Wrangler Sahara variant comes with climate control, a six-way adjustable driver's seat with lumbar support, ambient LED interior lighting, a leather-wrapped steering wheel and gear knob, an auto-dipping rear-view mirror, cruise control, an active speed-limiting device, and a 7-inch TFT instrument cluster display screen. Plus, infotainment is covered off to a level that previous generation Wrangler owners would be amazed at. There's an 8.4-inch centre dash Uconnect monitor, your access point for navigation, an eight-speaker Alpine premium audio system, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, and a range of Uconnect Live services. These include an off-road pages section with separate drivetrain, accessory gauge, and pitch and roll screens. For best use of this infotainment setup, you'll want to download the compatible Uconnect Live app onto your smartphone that will allow you to customise your onboard entertainment. You'll receive updates on your vehicle status and have all information relating to your journey brought to you in real time. There's also TuneIn Internet, a web radio with more than 10,000 stations from around the world. Plus, you can use the Deezer Internet music platform containing over 35 million tracks. There's a Reuters feed to keep abreast of world news. And, of course, you can access Facebook, Facebook check-in and Twitter so that friends and followers can be kept in touch with you as you traverse the wilds. Heaven only knows what General George Patton would have made of all that. As mentioned earlier, if you want more, there are two trim choices, Overland or this Rubicon trim. Both are identically priced and both include leather upholstery and heat for the front seats and steering wheel. If your destination is the King's Road rather than Kilimanjaro, you'll prefer one of the exclusive to Europe Overland spec models with their emphasis on looks and luxury. Hence the 18-inch polished aluminium wheels, the silver accents on the door mirrors and the front grille and the hard top headliner, plus blind spot monitoring and rear cross path detection. You could be excused, though, for questioning why you'd really ever want any more luxury in a Wrangler than the base Sahara variants can already offer. So many other conventional SUVs will cosset you more for this kind of money, but none of them can quite get you to the destinations that a Wrangler could manage to reach, especially in this top Rubicon form. Go with this most capable level of spec and your Jeep will come with all the extreme four-wheel drive hardware we mentioned earlier, plus a heavy-duty 240-amp alternator, an uprated 700-amp maintenance-free battery and an auxiliary switch bank. In addition, Rubicon variants get black fender flares, rock rails for extra underbody protection and slightly smaller 17-inch polished aluminium wheels with black pockets that look better suited to life in the wilds. On to options. We think the key thing to decide here is how you want your Wrangler's roof to be. Some might find the three lift-out panels of the standard Freedom Top to be rather fiddly and cumbersome, which is why Jeep offers some other choices that replace the detachable panels with various forms of fabric hood. On the two-door variant, this takes the form of a manually operable premium soft top covering the whole of the roof and available with either clear or tinted windows. On this four-door version, you can have what the company calls a black Sunrider soft top that slots in behind the two removable Freedom Top panels. These available either in black or body colour. The Sunrider hood folds back manually like the roof on a Mazda MX-5. Or even better, you can have it specified in Sky one-touch power top form with electrical operation. What else? The 
true lock differentials of this top Rubicon are one of the things that give this top variant its really extreme off-road ability. But you can replicate at least some of that capability on a lesser Sahara or Overland variant by specifying the optional anti-spin differential rear axle. Plus, on those Wrangler versions, you can add a towing predisposition pack, which gives you this Rubicon model's 240 amp alternator, 700 amp maintenance-free battery and auxiliary switch bank. If, on the other hand, you have gone for this Rubicon derivative, you might like to smarten the cabin atmosphere by adding in a hardtop headliner. Rubicon buyers can also pay extra for 17-inch black aluminium wheels with polished rims. Across the range, it's almost certain that you'll be paying your Jeep dealer extra for your preferred choice of colour. The only shade that comes as standard is solid bright white. Otherwise, you'll be paying more for one of the optional pastel or metallic colours, nearly all of which are jauntily titled with names like Sting Grey, Mojito and Punk and Metallic. We've got bright Hella Yella here. The exterior paint colour can also feature on the dash, but there are also silver and black leather wrapped options. As for the seats, well, whatever trim level you go for, you'll be offered upholstery finished either in black or brown heritage tan. Whether that's cloth, as in the case of Sahara variants, or leather, as with the other derivatives. Beyond that, it's really a question of how far you want to go. Jeep's partner Mopar has created a range of 180 accessories for this JL series model. For instance, there's what the brand calls a mesh bikini sunbonnet. Mesh fabric that goes over the roof area that's opened up when you remove the three-piece modular hardtop. The bikini attachment shielding the cabin from excessive buffeting. If you want to wade deep rivers, you'll need the Jeep Performance Snorkel to stop water being ingested by the engine. And if you'll be attacking really serious mountain trails, you might want the heavy gauge steel rock rails. Plus, maybe also the lift kit, which increases wheel articulation. If you want to go on safari or perhaps just nighttime rabbit shooting, you might want to add the five inch off-road spotlights that can sit on either side of the bonnet at the base of the windscreen. Once you get to your extreme destination, you might want to have the tailgate table that folds out of the rear door. And if you've loaded your Wrangler up with bulky camping gear, ideally you'll have protected the interior from damage with the optional molded cargo tray. Mopar slush mats are also available to protect the carpets. There are rear molded splash guards. You can fit extra grab handles and there's a smoker's pack if you haven't yet kicked the habit. Visual embellishments you can add include a huge 1941 graphic for the bonnet, plus there are 1941 stripes that can extend down the sides of the car. You might also want a black finish for the front grille, the fuel door, the mirror covers, and the door sill plates. On to safety. Now we've yet to see a Wrangler undergo a Euro NCAP crash test, which is perhaps just as well as autonomous braking hasn't made it to the Wrangler yet, nor have curtain airbags, though perhaps that's more understandable because of the detachable Freedom top. As you'd expect, there's ESC stability control and electronic roll mitigation. Plus, of course, there's traction control and ABS brakes with brake assist. As mentioned earlier, the Overland variants come with two extra safety features. Blind spot monitoring, which stops you from dangerously pulling out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. And rear cross path detection, which alerts you to oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a space. Both of these features can be optioned into a Rubicon variant at extra cost. What's the greenest car you can buy? A Toyota Prius, a Nissan Leaf, or perhaps a Jeep Wrangler? On what's called a dust-to-dust -dust calculation of a car's environmental impact, from its creation to its ultimate destruction, you'd probably be shocked to learn that it's the Jeep, according to figures released by CNW Research in America. Think about it, and it makes sense. The proportion of energy and CO2 used to make a car is much higher than the amount it consumes in its life. And Wranglers, after all, are designed simply, don't cost much to make, are easy to scrap, and go on forever. Small cars, EVs and hybrids are just the opposite. 
you'll need to remember all that because the fuel economy figures aren't exactly stellar, even if you compare them to larger but similarly priced SUV rivals. As you'd expect, the 2.2-litre diesel variant does best, aided by the multi-jet unit's sophisticated exhaust gas recirculation system and an underfloor SCR or selective catalytic reduction setup that reduces NOx emissions to negligible levels and ensures compliance with the latest RDE Euro 6D efficiency standards. As for the figures, well, in four-door Sahara form, a Wrangler diesel manages 36.7 mpg on the combined cycle and 202 grams per kilometre of CO2. You'll do a fraction worse than that with the heavier Rubicon variant, and obviously a fraction better with the lighter two-door body style. To give you some class perspective, a rival Toyota Land Cruiser five-door manages 38.1 mpg and 194 grams per kilometre and a Land Rover Discovery SD4 manages 43.5 mpg and 171 grams per kilometre. Here we've chosen to try the 2.0-litre GME petrol turbo engine, a unit that the Fiat Chrysler Group has spent a great deal of money developing. This was the first power plant of its kind to combine use of a special CEGR cooled gas recirculation system with twin scroll turbo technology, central direct injection and the independent liquid cooling intake of air, throttle body and turbo. Hence a set of efficiency returns that are actually pretty similar to those of the diesel model. So similar, in fact, that when combined with cheaper fuel, they would probably make this green pump fueled variant a little cheaper to run. Combined cycle economy is rated at 31.4 mpg in Sahara four-door form, with a CO2 reading of 210 grams per kilometre, or 28.2 mpg and 213 grams per kilometre for this Rubicon version. That looks pretty good, given that a less capable rival petrol Land Rover Discovery SI4 returns 29.4 mpg and 222 grams per kilometre. All the Wrangler readings just given were measured on the old NEDC cycle. Expect them to fall quite a lot when the brand has to use more real-world WLTP or World Harmonised Light Vehicle Test Procedure readings. By that time, though, Jeep will be offering petrol buyers a plug-in hybrid option. It already offers an e-torque mild hybrid version of this 2.0-litre engine in the US market, but has no plans to bring that power plant here. Both units you can have are aided by an ESS engine stop-start system, which cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. And as a driver, you can do your part by keeping an eye on the fuel economy meter. That's one of the options provided by the instrument binnacle screen. What else might you need to know? Well, the CO2 figures quoted and the high purchase price will see the few company Wrangler users paying a hefty 37% benefit in kind tax and a £310 luxury car vehicle excise duty supplement, which means a total road tax outlay of £450 in the first six years of ownership. At least residual values should be strong. Industry experts CAP HPI reckon that after the standard three-year or 60,000-mile period, a Wrangler Overland four-door two-litre petrol variant would still be worth 41% of its original purchase price. These days, Jeep offers a much more competitive customer after-sales package. The brand's 535 offer which gives you a five-year, 75,000-mile warranty, three years of servicing and five years of roadside assistance. Talking of servicing, the petrol models need a garage visit every year or every 9,000 miles, whichever occurs soonest. For the diesel variants, it's every year or 12,500 miles. Finally, we'll brief you on the insurance groups. In the petrol range, this two-litre model is normally rated at Group 41D or 40D in Rubicon 2 two-door form. In the diesel range, the Sahara and Overland two- and four-door models rate at Group 39D. A two-door Rubicon multi-jet is Group 37D, while a four-door Rubicon multi-jet is Group 38D.
You've still got to be serious about hardcore off-road driving to consider a Jeep Wrangler, but not quite as serious as you had to be before. This JL series model offers considerable improvements in refinement, quality and technology, which allows it to make a decent fist of providing versatile family transport for the user who doesn't mind making a few sacrifices at the altar of comfort, ride and handling. It's got a style all of its own, but its heart and soul remain on the Rubicon Trail rather than on the King's Road. Thank goodness for that. Drive one of these and it's clear that the Wranglers come a long way from the days of the old CJ and TJ series models, which tended to be driven by cigar-chomping beefcakes in aviator sunglasses trying to live out their World War II fantasies. And we're quite sure that those kinds of people will find something to hate about this JL series design. But we couldn't. As with buying an extreme sports car, choosing one of these is a wholly emotive purchase that will have very little basis in common sense. You'll want a Wrangler because it makes you smile, because it offers the prospect of opening up the wilderness, and because it makes you feel like the hero in your own action movie. We're disappointed that it's become so expensive and that given the money being asked, there isn't more standard safety kit. Otherwise, though, if you were to change most of the things a typical SUV buyer might dislike about this Jeep, you'd dilute its authenticity. And then there'd be no point to a Wrangler at all. Of course, it'd be a terrible choice if your SUV will have a heavy diet of on-road work, but that's like criticising a supercar for having a small boot. Horses need to be matched with courses, and if just occasionally those will take you to the back of beyond, you'll be glad you chose a Wrangler for the trip. If previous generation versions of this Jeep weren't for you, you probably still won't like this one. No problem, the market's stacked with compromised alternatives. But if you've always wanted an excuse to choose one of these, this JL series model's extra polish and newfound sophistication provides it. It's now a vastly more capable all-rounder, but it's still very much a Wrangler, and that's all that really matters. <laughs>